Good, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So quiet. What, what happened? Did I say something? Or didn't I say something yet? Good afternoon, Mr. Barnett. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Barnett. Thank you. I graduated from high school in 1970. And I recall in the late 60s on, on the, on the uh, Walter Cronkite on the news showing protests and marches for free, free speech from UC Berkeley. And these were all part of what was called the uh, counterculture movement, influenced by what then was known as the New Left. In the case of the protests at Berkeley, all that the students wanted was the right to engage in political speech on campus. And it was intertwined with the, the, with the uh, ongoing and broader civil rights movement and the protests uh, against the US war in Vietnam, both of which were ongoing at the time. From my first awareness of any social activism and protests about the righting the wrongs of society, I remember hearing the chant, no justice, no peace. And I'm sure that most people here have heard that complaint in sound bites on the news, even recently, or expressed on social media. It's certainly rooted in at least some truth in which and why it, it resonates with many people. No justice, no peace. A few days ago, I watched a prominent conservative uh, UK, in the UK interview a very vocal climate activist on his television show. The activist was deeply and visibly upset about the conservative's position on energy production to the point that she would not answer his questions about how she was going to get solar panels to produce power after sunset or how wind turbines were going to provide power on a calm day. In the activist's opinion, the issue of climate change was so urgently important and that so many people were going to die in famine and suffering as a result of, uh, of, of this man's climate policies. She wanted everybody to adopt renewable en energy, sustainable energy, in order to stop climate change and save humanity. And then a few days ago, we had the news of a mass murder in a school in Nashville by a young woman who was in the process of attempting to transition to be able to present as a male. It appears as if this event had been plotted for a long time prior to its execution. And it was reported that in the morning of the mass murder that she wrote to someone else that she wanted to die. One thing all these have in common is the tremendous level of chaos and inner turmoil in the lives of the principal figures, so much so that it must break your heart to think about what their lives must be like. Each, by their own decisions, were in the process of attempting to tear down and reject long-established ideals of society to uh, attempt a future society to build a better life for themselves and for uh, the more perfect society in general. They hope to find rest from the turmoil. And we know that this cannot happen. They cannot receive what they call justice. And, in, and for, them, for them, the path that they had taken in their own lives cannot, in the end, satisfy them. These people were spiritually blind and were continually falling into a ditch and then desperately climbing out, only to fall into another ditch. And as I said in this complaint, this complaint is no justice, no peace which has some truth, and a truth that brings us to an important component of God's system uh, and his plan of salvation. And if we read the words of Jesus, Jesus himself, in his own words, were clear on the subject of peace in this present age. For Matthew 10.34, please, or particularly the young people, turn to Matthew 10.34. You know, we have no justice, no peace, but Jesus said, do not think in Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring, bring peace, but a sword. And yet, just one chapter later, he said in Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I will be gentle and humble of heart, and you will find for your souls. And we know from several statements by Jesus, like John 14, 30, that in this present age, Satan is the chief prince or the power over humanity. 
And as long as Satan is in power, Jesus cannot bring peace. Only in the age to come, when Jesus is the Prince of Peace, as prophesied in Isaiah 9-6. This is a passage most people know because of its role in Handel's Messiah. When Jesus promises peace, it is only, it is only for those who follow Him. John 14-27 says, Peace will I leave you. My peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world does. Do not let your hearts be distressed or lack in courage. Justice is a noun that refers to the quality or process, the result of being just, fair, or righteous. The process, a result of being just, fair, or righteous. Justice can only exist in a, an environment, a system of law that is uniform in application, comprehensive and thorough. Justice requires an authoritative lawgiver, one who defines and defends, defines and defends righteousness. Any competently written contract must always state what jurisdiction controls and how it will be interpreted and how disputes will be adjudicated. The contract may even state that the parties agree in advance to a certain type of adjudication called arbitration. But by this agreement, by their agreement, each party agrees to place themselves under the jurisdiction and subjection of the adjudication authority, whatever it be, a judge or an adjudicator. And those who come to God, who repent and are baptized, in essence, agree to come under God's law and have the issues of their lives adjudicated under His justice and in His aspects uh, and accept the penalty for the violations of His law. And those penalties have to be paid in the, in, in, in the end by Jesus Himself. And it is one aspect of what Jesus referred to when He said, it is finished. You know, when Jesus was on the cross and He said, it is finished, this is what he's among others was he was referring to. The deepest aspect of the Passover comes to us from several directions. The first is that God used Egypt as a primary metaphor for the all-consuming grip that the God of this world has upon all upon who fall into his jurisdiction, which is just about all humanity. God makes the separation between people who are his and people of the world, of Egypt as sharp as the contrast between light and dark. And while all Israel was under the Sinai Covenant for many centuries, there were times when Israel, Israel individually had the opportunity to vote with their feet and by their decision to return to the land of Israel when they had been exiled, they in essence reconfirmed their acceptance of that covenant. The bulk of the tribes who revolted under the death, after the death of Solomon gradually lost interest in the covenant relationship as well. And as so, when James wrote his epistle, do many, uh, many trans, uh, generations later, he decided uh, it, it is dedicated to the tribes scattered abroad. And now historians insist there is no such thing as lost tribes. That's how far it's gone. The second point is the admonition and command of God that we can see in Revelation 18. Revelation 18.4, where it says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and, ye, and that you receive not her plagues. Just as God once commanded his physical nations to leave the world in a physical sense, he commands his spiritual nation to leave the world and, and to leave in the spirit of the world. God has uh, had this theme for a long time. If we would consider the passage in Hebrew scriptures that Paul wrote. Now there is an interesting passage and you know you learn something every day and as I was researching the sermonette I come across the notes that uh, were, were in one of my commentaries for 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 16 to 18. Second, you can put this in your notes 2 Corinthians 6 16 to 18 and this this passage is actually a composite of about 10 passages in the Old Testament. It's really, really, really interesting. It's a, comp it's a composite scripture. The, the, the third aspect is the integrity, uh, uh, sorry, is the intelligently designed reality requires 
an intelligent designer. Our reality was one that made human life possible. And that designer, our creator, uh, certainly uh, used wonderful intelligence to design it. Such a design dictates an equally intelligent moral law for humans. And that law is, has no effect without the power to judge or adjudicate disputes, to issue judgments, and to enforce them. The power to define the law implies the power to judge based on it. And thus, a design demands a designer of both the design and the law that allows it to function with its intended purpose, and that demands the ability to judge and impose remedies. And now we live under a better covenant, established on better promises, as it says in Hebrews 8.6. That covenant is entirely voluntary. It is oriented at faith and not lineage. This is a covenant that God invites us to, but that the person must accept and indicate their agreement with by stay, staying true to it over time. And as was recently quoted uh, in another uh, sermon, John 14, 23, if Jesus said, if anyone loves me, you will obey my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and take up residence with him. And then this in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. You cannot force someone to love God nor to want to obey him. You can force someone to stop fighting, but then you cannot force someone to be at peace with themselves. You can force someone to cease work, like on the Sabbath, but, it, but you can't stop them, uh, you, you can't uh, force them to enter into the rest that God created for humanity. All of these things can only come by a change of heart, mind, and spirit. By assuming responsibility for the sins of humanity and by paying the price for those sins, Jesus becomes both Savior and Judge of humanity. We know that by passages like Revelation 20:12, that Jesus will judge all humanity who ever lived, for it says, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne. Then the books were opened, and other books were opened, the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to their deeds. And this brings me to the main point I want to make. People yearn for peace, and they yearn for the justice that brings peace in society. Above all, they yearn for peace and rest that comes from having their inner chaos and turmoil resolved. God's law instructs us as to what attitudes and behavior God seeks, God seeks and which he forbids. And that alone addresses much of the turmoil we see today. That alone will bring far more peace and just society. And Jesus, as our Savior and righteous judge, makes that possible. The Holy Spirit allows us to understand God far more deeply and to act based on that knowledge. It says in Philippians 4, 7, The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. No physical force can cause a person to internalize the spiritual forces, the spiritual values and attitude that leads to love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. People must come to God of their own free will and ask for His Holy Spirit and follow His way of life to have these blessings in their lives. The blessings of the soul at rest are only those that God can provide. The day will come when mankind will beat their swords into plowshares, as we are told, when humanity does not need to spend any energy or resources learning how to make war, nor preparing for war. It will also be a day when nobody will complain, no justice, no peace. And this is all made possible because of what Jesus did as our Passover, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world for us and for all humanity.